Three days ago, Hanukkah began. More or less, pretty minor Jewish holiday, celebrating a military victory. The synopsis goes, like so many Jewish holidays, they tried to kill us, they didn't, let's eat. <laughs> I imagine, I think a bunch of you, like, like me, grew up celebrating Hanukkah, lighting the menorah, maybe exchanging gifts. It's a holiday that is also a history lesson. Here's the history lesson portion of it. Alexander the Great conquers Jerusalem in the third century BCE. And for seven generations, the kings who rule over Judea, more or less modern day Israel, there are no major problems. Israel had already been occupied territory for centuries by the time the Syrian kings came along. So everything goes fine enough until 167 BCE when a new king comes along who tries to force the Jews to give up their traditional laws and practices. And to do that, one of the ways that he does that is to go to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, you got to back up 2,200 years from the present day. There are no synagogues in Judaism at the time. There is no diaspora of Jews spread out over Europe and the Mediterranean. Back then, the temple in Jerusalem is the, the, the axis of the entire spiritual world of Judaism. All the sacrifices, the holidays, the festivals, they happen in that place. Not spread out, not at home, in that place. And what the king does, what this king does, is defile the temple, goes in and destroys it and goes into places that no one is supposed to go into and puts statues and idols up of whatever gods he was a fan of. Well, outraged by this, Judah Maccabee and his brothers, sons of a priest in the temple, lead a revolt. And after two bitter and bloody years, they win, they free Jerusalem. The temple is rededicated. And as one version of the story goes, they light the holy lamps in the temple. And though these lamps have only one day of oil in them, they burn for eight days, giving enough time to consecrate and prepare more oil. That's the Hanukkah miracle, that's the end of the story. The wait was over, the war was over, the temple was holy again, and the center of all things, the axis of the world, had been restored. Now maybe the meaning of the story, and one of the things that I think is true is, you say, what is the meaning of this story? And for almost any question in Judaism, the answer is, well, our rabbis have multiple opinions. <laughs> so maybe, maybe the significance of this story and the point of celebrating it is to celebrate self-determination, right? This occupying empire is thrown off. A people once again have freedom to practice their religion. Perhaps the story is emblematic of this universal hope for liberation. The song uh, Rock of Ages, if you, you probably sang this if you grew up lighting Hanukkah candles. It ends with the encouragement that the time is nearing which will see all people free, tyrants disappearing. That interpretation is not what the point of Hanukkah was for a good long stretch. For most of the history of Hanukkah, most of those 2,000 years, the major point of the story was not to celebrate an improbable military victory. It was not to rejoice at the existence of a Jewish state and the necessity for it. It was not about religious freedom at all. Instead, the victory of Hanukkah embedded in that story was of a people who kept their identity and practice in the face of a world which either wanted them assimilated and disappeared or dead and disappeared. That is to say, the victory of Hanukkah was not the political and military victory, but holding fast to an identity in a world that didn't want you. 
a friend of mine told me that as a as a Jewish child, as a more or less secular Jewish child growing up in this country in the 1960s, she said Hanukkah took on this much greater significance than it ever deserved because we were growing up in a predominantly Christian community. Living in the Midwest, she said, I encountered children who had never known a Jew before me. And I learned the meaning of anti-Semitism firsthand. At Christmas time, she writes, we were overwhelmed because Christianity was all around us on the television, in stores, in our neighbors' homes. And we were outsiders looking in on this world we did not understand. Hanukkah became a way for us to reassert who we are in a world where we didn't quite fit in. And lighting the menorah each night was not a matter of recognizing God's miracle. It was a matter of reconnecting to our past. Reconnecting to the past and holding on to your identity in a world that wants you to disappear. For most of the last 2,000 years, Judaism has been a diaspora religion, communities spread across Europe and Middle East and Africa. And those communities looked to the Hanukkah story as a story of of the profound commitment to being Jewish, to practicing. It was a connection to history and to hope. But then again, maybe the meaning of the Hanukkah story is neither of those things. Maybe its significance is that it was not the end of history. When we tell the story, and it ends in this lovely independent state with self-determination and the ability to practice their own religion, that lasts barely a hundred years before the Romans roll over that part of the world and it becomes occupied territory again, as it was during the life of Jesus. But that occupation wasn't the end of history either. The temple is demolished entirely for a second and final time in the first century. The heart and center of the people and nation is broken and Judaism becomes something other than what it was. It becomes instead centered around houses of prayer and study synagogues led by teachers, rabbis, and Jews are set adrift into diaspora, persecution, Nor is that the end of history either, because there is a Jewish state once again in Palestine, and that's not the end of history, because it's an occupied territory, contested, still, bloody, uncertain. We expect, or maybe at least want, stories to have a beginning and a middle and an end that ties things up. Either the good guys win or the good guys lose. Not, there aren't exactly good guys and bad guys, and they live in a state of permanent ambiguity. It's less satisfying. (laughs) Rebecca Solnit, in her book, Hope in the Dark, talks about this, wrestles with what does it mean to live in a world where there are no happy endings or sad endings, because the world never finished being made. She puts it this way. She says, a million years ago, I wrote a few features for the punk magazine Maximum Rock and Roll, and one of them was about women's rights. And a cranky guy wrote in that women used to make 67 cents to the male dollar, and now we make 77 cents. So what are we complaining about? (laughs) And she says it should not be so complicated to acknowledge that 77 cents is better than 66 cents. And it's not good enough. But she writes, the politics we have is so pathetically skewed, there's only two ways to tell the story. Either 77 cents is a victory, and victories are the point where you shut up and stop fighting. Or 70 cents is ugly. So activism accomplishes nothing, and what's the point of fighting? But both of these versions are defeatist because they're static. 
What's missing from both of those ways to tell the story is the ability to recognize a situation in which you are both traveling and have not yet arrived. In which you have caused both to celebrate and to fight. In which the world is always being made and never finished. When I go looking for some scrap of hope for what's happening in Israel right now, it can only be that, that the world is not yet finished and still being made. The hope that I find in that is not that the Hamas murder of 1,200 people will somehow mysteriously automatically result in autonomy for an occupied people. My hope in that is not that the destruction and killing have a point or purpose or end which justifies or makes right the incidental killing of thousands of civilians by Israel. The hope that I find in that is not that atrocity is what's needed for peace to someday emerge. None of that. Instead, the hope in the midst of this is that atrocity is not the whole story. The hope is that the world is not finished being made, that this chapter is not the end of the book, that peace is plausible, is possible, alongside the parade of horrors. And that's what history teaches us. History teaches hope. I learned that phrase from Dr. Timuel Black, history teaches hope. I think he said it in just about every conversation I ever had with him. Let me tell you about the man who taught me that. Dr. Timuel Black was the child of sharecroppers and the grandchild of slaves. And he lived all 102 years of his life on the south side of Chicago a historian, an educator, an author, an activist. History teaches hope, he said. Serving in World War II with the army, he was among the first soldiers who saw the atrocities of the Buchenwald concentration camp. And leaving as a liberator, he returned home to a city, a state, a country deeply divided by state-sponsored and enforced segregation. But he returned with this commitment that would come to define his life, a call to build a land where justice rolls down like waters and peace like an ever-flowing stream. History teaches hope, he said. In 1956, he invited Dr. King to speak in Chicago for the first time. And a few years later, he was the organizer bringing thousands of Chicagoans to the 1963 March on Washington. He was a teacher and a political organizer behind the campaign of the city's first black mayor. He was a trusted advisor to a young law school professor in the neighborhood, a skinny kid with funny name, who thought he might go into politics and ended up doing pretty well for himself. History teaches hope. Here's the thing. Dr. Black was an African-American man who spent every one of his 102 years on the south side of Chicago. He was not naive for one moment about the world around him or his place in it as a black man. That's not what he meant when he says history teaches hope. It's not naivete. It's not the inevitable upward trajectory of life. It is the possibility of transformation. Hope means that waiting for us inside of this world as it is right now, inside of this status quo, there is something else. There is another world, another way of being, like a nesting doll inside of this one. And it's not guaranteed or easy or inevitable, but it is possible. And terrible things happen over again. And we make the same mistakes over again. History teaches hope, not naively, not cynically. Rebecca Solnit 
It says amnesia, forgetting the past, forgetting the history, leads to despair in many ways because the status quo would like you to believe it is immutable, inevitable, invulnerable, and lack of memory of a dynamically changing world reinforces this view. In other words, when you don't know how much things have changed, you don't see that they are changing or that they can change. I hear this sometimes when I, I hear people saying, well, Israelis and Palestinians have been fighting this fight for 2,000 years. No, <laughs> that, that is not in fact the history of that part of the world. It's complicated. It's not over, it's not done, but that's not what the history is either. Amnesia leads to despair, and history teaches hope. Solna is not saying that anything is guaranteed. She's not saying things are gonna get better. She's not saying bad things aren't bad. It is a much more modest and revolutionary suggestion that hope lives right exactly inside of difficulty of the worst moments. Nothing is inevitable and nothing is impossible. You can hold grief in one hand and possibility in the other, not because our work is to weigh them against each other, never because loss justifies hope, but because both of these things are true at once. I heard another interpretation of the meaning of the story of Hanukkah. Someone told me once that the most interesting part of this whole story, the most important part, the most relevant part for us, was not the stuff about revolution or political autonomy, and it certainly wasn't the stuff about oil burning for eight days instead of one and miracles. They told me, no, no, the most important part of this story is that the people who lit the lamp knew they only had enough oil for one day. They were not expecting it to burn for eight. They were not naive about what they had in their hand. They didn't expect it to burn forever. They knew what was possible was only enough for a little light to shine. And not naively, not cynically, but resolute, Grounded and steady, they lit a light in darkness, a hope for the future. Amen. <laughs>